Welcome to Gambling with an Edge. And now, here are Bob and Richard. Good afternoon. Welcome to Gambling with an Edge. I'm Bob Dancer. And I'm Richard Munchkin. Our today is Maria Kova, who is promoting her new book, Biggest Bluff, How to Pay Attention, Master Myself, and Win, which has been released a few days ago by the Penguin Press. Maria Konnikova, welcome to Gambling with an Edge. Thank you so much for having me. It's always a pleasure. Thank you. Before we get to the actual interview, I read an excerpt of your book recently on 538.com about not being due for a good poker hand. Listeners can get a sneak preview there if they'd like. Have you had any other excerpts published in places our listeners might be able to check? Sure. Um, there was an essay on Sunday um, in the New York Times and the Sunday Review. So that's both online um, and in print if you if you get the print paper. And there are also some excerpts running in The Atlantic, um, in Wired, in Slate, and in Vanity Fair, and maybe one or two others that I'm forgetting, for which I'm sorry. Wow, that's only six more than I got when I, my book was published. <laughs> so, how um, about you, Richard? <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, the the one question that I, uh, from the very beginning, that I wanted to uh, ask is, how did you convince Eric Seidel? Uh, well, for our listeners who, who aren't familiar. <laughs> You basically were a psychologist and a writer who went to Eric Seidel and convinced him to mentor you so you could spend a year uh, playing tournament poker and write a book about it. Um, how did you get him to do this? Because he's notoriously <laughs> not willing to do those kinds of things. Yeah, it's the it's a million-dollar question. And um, to be honest – because I knew nothing about the poker world. Um, I had no idea that he was notoriously you know, reticent and that he didn't want to take on students and that he'd never taken on any students. That probably would have um, been very uh, scary for me. And I may never have approached him. So luckily, you know, sometimes, sometimes ignorance really is bliss. So I um, approached him and I think what was interesting to him was that I wasn't a poker player telling him, hey, you know, make me a better poker player. Give me advice on how to play. I was someone who had just no background in the game whatsoever, but did have a very different uh, background who had psychology, who was a writer. And I think it intrigued him to see, okay, you know, this is a chance to actually work with a blank slate and train someone up from the bottom and see, you know, can this kind of background actually make someone successful in modern day when everyone is working with solvers and when people think that that's the only way to go? Can I take someone who can think in a different way um, and can I teach her? So I think that that was part of the appeal. I think the other part of it was that Eric truly loves the game. I mean, he is just his his love is pure. It is, it is not for, you know, the money or the fame or any of that. He just he loves it. He loves playing and he thinks it's a fascinating game. And because I'm someone from the outside and I'd written two New York Times bestsellers um, and I had an audience that wasn't a poker audience, I think to him, he saw it as an opportunity. He, he saw it as an investment at some point in the future where I might be able to popularize the game and bring it to a new group of players who've never had any interest in it before. So it, it seems like, I mean, there are two aspects of the game, like the psychological side and math side. And so in your case, you're coming as a psychologist and having to learn a certain amount of math. Do you think that that is a better starting point or with a math guy who wants to learn something about the psychology of the game? You know, I think it depends on the person. I think that the answer is going to be different for every different brain. I think you need to sit down with yourself if you want to learn poker and go, okay, what am I good at? What are my strengths? Where is my edge going to be? For me, the answer to that question was easy. I have a PhD in psychology. The last math class I took was in high school. So it wasn't a toss up. It was very clear where, where my strength was going to be. I think any good player will tell you, you need both. You can't do one without the other. You can't do one in a vacuum. And so ultimately, 
you know, I, yes, I started psychologically. That's my background. That's my approach. Um, and yet I ended up learning how to use PO Solver and running simulations and doing all of that later on because I wanted to be competitive at the highest level. So all of these things are essential. So, but for me, the psychology was a definite starting point. For someone whose mind is very mathematically oriented and that's how they see the world and that's really their approach, I think that that's the natural starting point. Start with your strengths and then work on weaknesses. So it came to Eric, you didn't, you just said poker, and somehow that got converted into tournament, no limit, hold them. There's a lot of different kinds of poker. How did you end up with tournament? No limit hold'em. The no limit hold'em was easy, um, and that's because that was what John von Neumann played, and that was the model for game theory. Von Neumann had looked at all the variants of poker. Those are not all the variants that exist today, because obviously there was no Badugi or other <laughs> other games that have been created in the modern uh, modern era. But he looked at all sorts of variants of poker, and he thought for human decision making, no limit hold'em is the best model because it's a perfect balance of known to unknown information. So in some kinds of poker, there are just too many down cards, too much private information, and it becomes too much of a crapshoot. It's gambling. It's not It's not skill anymore. There's just too much unknown. And the opposite can be true. It can be too much of just a almost mathematical certainty. If, you know, there's just one card that, that's in the hole and everything else is, is known. And he thought that No Limit Hold'em was actually the perfect balance, the two cards um, and the element of No Limit, because... Von Neumann argued that life is no limit. You can always go all in at any moment. And so if you want to figure out strategic negotiation, you have to have that element. So limit games were just out from the beginning. That was not even an option. Um, and then as far as tournament poker, that was Eric. So he and I talked about cash versus tournaments. I didn't know that there was, you know, I knew nothing about poker. I didn't even realize that there was a difference and I didn't realize just how different it was. And he said, we need to focus on one because there are different games. I mean, it's the same game, but it's different there. And if you're going to become good quickly, or if you want to learn something quickly, you need to focus. And I completely agreed with him. And we decided that tournaments were a much better model for life because they're more dynamic. There's a beginning, there's a middle, there's an end, there's a story trajectory there, there's drama. Cash games are, there's much more just one strategy. You know, you're, you're, you're in a game that can last indefinitely, and some, I think, cash games do last indefinitely for days and days on end with seemingly no end in sight. So that's how we came upon tournaments. Now, Eric has a somewhat zen approach to poker. In your book, you never discuss such things as how to play suited connectors in the cutoff seat <laughs> when you're short stacked. But you do give some insight into Eric's way of thinking. For poker players, how much of that insight do you think they will find valuable? I honestly don't know because I think it will depend on the player, but I hope that all of it is valuable to some extent because I think it's a really powerful mindset, and I think that mindset is a really big part of poker. I think the mental game is huge. I think how you approach spots is huge. How you think through problems is huge. And so while Eric never told me this is how you play a suited connector from a cutoff, it wasn't because he was trying to withhold information. It was because he didn't want me to ask that question. His idea is that is the wrong question to ask. You cannot just memorize how to play different hands from different positions. You need to always ask why and think about the thought process. You want to know how to play a suited connected from the cutoff? Fine. Who are you playing with? Who, what's the table like? Who are all the players still to act? What's happened before you? How many chips do you have? What's going to happen when you raise? Is someone going to three bet you? Is someone going to four bet you? What are you going to do then? How are you going to play on this board? How are you going to play on that board? We're going to talk for the next five hours, and then you'll have an answer to 25 million different ways you can play suited connectors in the cutoff. But really, we're just talking through the process. We are forcing you to pay attention to all of your opponents and to be able to rattle off the answers to all these things I'm asking you. I get so mad at Eric at the beginning when I was trying to describe a hand, and he's like, well, how many times has this guy raised? I'm like, I don't know. I'm still trying to figure out you know, what, what to do here. And but he was just forcing me to pay attention to all of these variables and to start noting them as a matter of course. And that was so incredibly valuable. And 
his approach is you have to think through every hand for yourself because there's no such thing as a right way to play a hand. Um, and sure, there are some general rules, like maybe when you're under the gun, don't off, don't open seven deuce offsuit, but maybe sometimes you do. Did uh, you and Eric's wife hit it off immediately? You're a, a lovely woman about the age of Eric's daughters, and you convinced Eric's to agree to a year-long unpaid mentorship when he's never mentored anybody, paid or unpaid before. <laughs> In some marriages, yeah. such an arrangement would send off alarm bells. <laughs> um, no, you know what? Eric um, is a mentor of all things, including how to live life. He and Rua have been married for over 30 years, um, and his daughters are amazing. And I met Rua right away. Um, we all went out to breakfast, you know, a few weeks after Eric and I decided that we might be working together. And it's not like Eric just said yes. He said, you know, let's just see how this works. Let's see if we all get along. Um, so we all went to breakfast, and it was lovely. We, you know, very soon all of us exchanged phone numbers and they just kind of adopted me as part of their family. I I think it has to be that way because I'd be in their apartment, you know, playing poker videos for Eric. Um, so I, you know, I would bring them breakfast if I came in the morning and I'd try to bring something else if I came later in the day. And it's invasive. And I understood that. And I really appreciate how open they were um, and how much they trusted me, right, that they trusted that I wasn't going to, you know, do a some sort of a gotcha thing that they just were really lovely people. Um, and his daughters are amazing. Just he is definitely a role model to me in how to live life to the fullest, how to have this insane poker career, have daughters who worship you, have a strong marriage, you know, with a wife who, you know, lets you go off to your tournaments whenever you want and then comes with you sometimes um, when she wants and to the locations that she wants. It's kind of amazing. And also, go to all the theater shows and go to all the restaurants and know all the latest bands. And it's just a life filled with curiosity and passion and, and interest. And to me, that's the reason he's such a great poker player. Um, you know, and over time we had couples nights where um, they met my husband and we had, we would have dinner and go to the theater together. So um, I think the, the relationship really evolved over the years because obviously it ended up being more than a year. Right. So at the end of the year, you were a winning poker player and decided to continue as a professional poker player rather than, I mean, obviously you're still a writer, but you're still playing poker now. And uh, I mean, I don't know how that's going now with the COVID thing, but. Yeah. Well, so the book was supposed to be out in the middle of the World Series. I mean, June 23rd, the date was chosen with care, <laughs> but we can't predict any we can't predict what's going to happen. So um, my last poker was played back in January. Um, I was on my way to LAPC and was in New Orleans for, for another event beforehand and ended up changing my tickets and going back because the data coming out became too worrying to me and I didn't think that it was responsible to go. And I haven't played a hand of live poker since. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. I'm certainly not setting foot anywhere in a casino until there's a vaccine and very good medicine and we know more about this. I just think it's, you know, everyone can decide for themselves, but I think for me it's completely irresponsible. So I don't see live poker in my future through 2020, probably through the first half of 2021. Um, so we'll see. But I am going to New Jersey in July to play the WSOP online. So we'll do that. Now, one of the things I thought was interesting is um, there are times in the book where you knew you had screwed up, but you didn't tell Eric. Like, you did not <laughs> want to tell him. And I'm just curious – um, that surprised me that you weren't completely open with him about those things. I was uh, I was pretty open about most things, but you know I'm I was sheepish, and I uh, there were some things that I didn't necessarily feel like sharing at the in the exact moment because Eric is never one to sugarcoat stuff. I mean, he is very very capable of saying you fucked up. You know, that, that is not good. And, and he did that many times. And so you don't go to him when you want someone to say, Oh, it's okay. It'll all be okay. He's like, Yeah, no, this was bad. <laughs> I don't know what you were thinking. <laughs> so, so there were definitely some moments where I just decided that 
now I, I couldn't handle that. Um, and then it just kind of came and went and I conveniently forgot, but he read all about it in the book. So, <laughs> so now he knows. And then, and to be fair, it's not, it wasn't often, it was just a few different things. Like I wasn't completely honest about, you know, the, the number of bullets I may have or may not have fired in the Colossus. Um, <laughs> Things like that. <laughs> had yeah. had he had a piece of, of my action, I certainly would have been honest about the number of bullets. <laughs> now you had an amazing number of tutors to help you play better in addition to Eric. You got tips from Dan Harrington, Phil Gaffon, Patrick Antonius, Vanessa Selps, Andrew Lichtenberger, Ike Axon, Jason Kuhn, and I'm probably leaving out several that you mentioned in the book. <laughs> That just don't come to mind right now. That's an incredible list of mentors. Yes. And it appears that all of them gave you valuable advice they didn't charge you for. How in the hell did you pull it off? <laughs> I think that um, everyone was truly excited about this project. And it certainly helped that Eric is the one who introduced me. And people love Eric. You know, Eric is someone who just is a genuinely good person. And I think everyone knows that. And when Eric introduced me to people, I think their attitude was very different had I just come off the street. But I think that for you know someone like Phil Galfond, Phil is trying to grow the game. I mean, it's a passion for him, just like it is for Eric. I mean, he's run it once as an incredible training resource, but he's trying to launch a poker site. You know, that is, that is really difficult, which is just a poker site for poker players. Um, and so he, you know, for, I think it was for all of them long term thinking, thinking if, if this succeeds, if this girl can get good, we, if we can put some of this out there, then more people will come to this game. At the top, you will be surprised. All of those guys are so generous. They're so smart. They're so kind. And they're really willing to help. And it wasn't, it wasn't like I tried to convince them to do this. There was not a single person in the book for whom it was pulling teeth or anything like that. All of the people who are in the book volunteered and said, hey, if you ever need help, talk to me. If you ever need this, ask me. Um, and I think it's because they love the game and they want it to succeed. And they see that, you know, with people from the outside like me, um, then it's a chance for poker to realize more of its potential with the general audience. When you were on our show before, you said your parents were your number one fans. Still true. <laughs> but you have a grandmother who is not so impressed. <laughs> Tell us about that. This is true. Baba Anya is now 95 years old. I actually managed to see her for her 95th birthday in February, just before lockdown. So I'm very glad that that's happened. Um, and I think that when I first told her I was going to be playing poker, she just she thought that, you know, I, I had sold my soul to the devil and this was the end of the world. And she could not she could not believe what she was hearing. And, and you it thought was, you didn't. <laughs> and I thought I had it. Yes. <laughs> and she was just ter horrified. I think she had a lot of these preconceptions about what poker is. And she thought, you know, she's going to just gamble away everything. She she's going to be lost at a roulette table in her mind. You know, it's all it's all the same thing. Um, and I tried to explain to her that, you know, poker is not gambling. Poker is a skill game. Um and on and on and on, you know, von Neumann. <laughs> let me let me give you a few key key names here. <laughs> um, and uh, it just she wasn't having any of it. And then every for the last three years since since I undertook this project, every time she saw me, she'd be like, "So are you done yet? Can you stop playing poker now? <laughs> Can you you know why don't you become a professor?" And I've never been a professor. You know that's not something I've ever done. Um, I've I've been in academia as a grad student, but after my PhD, I was out of there. So I taught, but but not a not as a professor. And it's so funny. She just she just every single time. So are you done yet? So are you done yet? But the last time actually that I saw her um, for her 95th birthday, it's the first time that I saw her soften a little because I just I really I tried again. I tried my hardest. I tried to explain 
you know, what I found um, and how much it's helped me in terms of decision making and how many life skills it's given me that I really thought that it made me a much better thinker, a better person in a lot of ways. Um, and I think that it finally got through a little bit. And she said, you know, well, at least it looks like, you know, it's opened a lot of doors for you. So that's good. And and that um, that made me that made me very happy it was a start. Warmed my heart. What All she hope is not lost. <laughs> What um, she had the capability of reading and uh, and appreciating your book. Um, absolutely, she reads all the time. So, and she does read in English, not just in Russian. So, I hope she'll have a chance to read it when it comes out. Oh, you didn't get her an advanced copy? <laughs> no, no one in my family did. So, I hope I hope that she uh, I hope that she doesn't mind that she's in its pages. Number one rule of memoir writing, do not show it to any family members until it's out. <laughs> um, wow. So, so I broke that rule. Yeah, you, you mentioned you haven't played uh, any poker since January. What are you doing? Um, well, I've been working on the book and doing excerpts and, you know, interviews and all of these things. And I have played a little bit online. Um, so I've been playing in some home games online and studying. Um, I've been doing a lot of work on my poker game, the things that I can do while not playing. So I've been watching a lot of Run It Once videos and um, some Poker Go stuff and talking with Eric um, and doing my best to kind of stay current and stay on top of all of that. But mostly it's been writing um, and thinking um, about the book and about the launch over the last few months. You eventually decided to hire a mental coach, something to help you keeping your spirits up and project the right image at the table. This would seem something that a psychology Ph.D. would not need. I thought so, too. But I was wrong. (laughs) So why did you do it and how did it work? So I realized, you know, for a long time, I thought I do not need a mental coach. And the coach I eventually hired, Jared Tendler, had reached out to me very early on in the process and said, hey, I see that, you know, I've heard that you're working on this book. If you ever want to talk, let me know. And I looked him up and he was legit and had these great testimonials. But I thought, I'm a psychology PhD. I don't need a mental coach. (laughs) And as I started playing, as I found myself in certain situations, When I tried to do an objective self-assessment, which Eric forced me to do over and over and over, I realized that, you know, I was not always playing my best game because I was letting things get to me. I was, you know, there were things that bothered me. There were things I couldn't quite control. Um, I would make bad decisions sometimes, like entering the Colossus hole, you know, however many times I entered it. That's the Colossus for for people who play the World Series of Poker. Um, and that was obviously not a rational decision. There was no good reason for me to enter that thing five or six times or however many I entered it. it that's in the book. I don't remember. I tried to block that part of my summer out of my mind. But but that was clearly a mistake. And I didn't tell I didn't tell Eric about that because I was embarrassed and I knew that I had just let all of this get to me. And so soon after that, I realized, you know what, maybe I do want to just see what this mental coach is all about. Um, And it ended up that it was such a good decision because you can't coach yourself. You need and it's very hubristic to think that you don't need any help. The mental game is really difficult. Poker is a game that takes a lot out of you, especially if you're playing tournament poker, it's not cash. You can't get away from the table, you know, when you're not feeling it. You can't suddenly stand up, you know, and say, you know, I'm going for a walk. I'm taking an hour break. I'm doing this now. You can't do that. You have to play. Um, you have to wait till the break, and the break is 10 minutes long or however long it is. It's not however long you want it to be. And so you get tired, especially when you're playing multi-day tournaments. It takes a lot out of you. I mean, emotionally, you're trying to make good decisions. Cognitively, it's it's just draining. And whenever you're in a situation that drains you, that's that depletes your resources, your decisions are going to be compromised. You need to know, what do I do then? You know, how do I manage this? How do I respond? How do I control these things? How do I make it so I get less tired? How do I manage things before they get out of hand? And it's hard to see yourself objectively from the sidelines. Sometimes you need someone else so that you can talk through things and so that you can see things that should have been obvious to you, but aren't because you cannot see yourself with any amount of objectivity. You know, every, um, 
female poker player that we've had on has talked about the sexism they face at the table. Um, was that one of the things that would take you out of your game? And how did you deal with that? Um, so, of course, there's a lot of sexism at the poker table. It's inevitable when you are one of the 3% of females and there's 97% of men and a lot of them are just not used to having women at the table. I've been called names. I've been propositioned. Um, all of these things have happened. And at the end of the day, um, the thing that made me realize just how much this got me off my game was a guy who called me little girl and kept calling me little girl from the moment I sat down and just wouldn't stop. And he, I mean, he was smart. He was a good player. He was doing it on purpose to get to me and he got to me. He ended up knocking me out of the tournament. But that was when I realized, wow, this really is a trigger for me. Um, this is something that I need to work on. And Jared actually had a really good solution for it. Um, I'd gotten noise canceling headphones after this instance. And he said, you need to put those on preemptively, not when someone starts bothering you, but beforehand so that you have control over your space so that you don't have to be involved in that social interaction so that there's no pressure on you to respond. Because if you think about the dynamics at a poker table, if a guy's saying, hey, little girl, and then you're not answering, they're like, hey. You know, too good for us? Why aren't you answering? They'd never do that to like this huge dude with tattoos, but they do it to me because they feel like they can get away with it. Um, you know, why aren't you holding up your end of the conversation? And so there's this pressure, there's this negative dynamic, it gets to you. If you put on those headphones ahead of time, you can just pretend to not hear and you can pretend to just not be part of that conversation, even if you do hear everything going on. And so it just takes the emotional pressure off. And I found that to be remarkably useful and there are certain people i obviously i will not name any names that i know get to me um and if i see if i'm approaching a table and i see them there you bet those headphones are coming on before i even sit down so that i sit down with them on and don't have to interact uh for a while with anyone so you never considered gaining 100 pounds and getting tattoos in order to stop this <laughs> well I'd, I'd also need to get some testosterone injections i think Oh, well, okay. That sounds doable. Um, now, but, but yeah, no, it's, it's very different playing while female. That's just, that's just the truth of it. But I will say for, for any women listening to this, as you move up in stakes, it becomes much easier. The higher you go, the nicer the people are. So get good, get better. Um, and if your buy-ins increase, the people's quality will also increase. Really? I've seen like, Almost to the final table when, like, Mike Matisau would do things that... Oh, yes. There are exceptions to everything. I'm not saying everyone is great at the higher levels, but in general, the player pool quality is much higher. Now, you mentioned uh, two or three times that the uh, three dozen times you entered the Colossus was a mistake. Uh, <laughs> why was it a mistake? You didn't I didn't say have... It was it was less it was like six months after I started playing poker. I didn't I didn't have an edge in that field. That was it was insanity to think that I did. You know, why would I take it was great to take a shot at this tournament with a very affordable buy in, but I made it into this crazy non affordable buy in just because everyone, you know, I'd become friendly with a lot of the pros and they're like, Oh, you gotta gotta fire again. This is such a great field. And yeah, it was a great field. I was the great field. <laughs> And they needed to get back in there. Um, and I think it's it's hard to recognize that you don't have an edge. And I didn't. Um, and I should have just stopped firing those bullets. I wasn't used to the structure. I wasn't used to the pressure. It was my first event ever at the World Series. You know, I just um, it was something that I was just I was completely unprepared for. And just to show you how unprepared I was. On my first bullet, I almost made the money. I was actually, I had run up a huge stack and I just punted it all off because I didn't realize how hard it was to do what I was doing. I just assumed that I'd be able to do it again. It didn't happen anymore. All the other bullets went much more sadly. <laughs> People would, I would assume that a psychologist would be better than average at interpreting tells being given off by other players. Did you find this to be true in your case? Well, um, I think I was much more aware of the fact that it's 
very difficult to interpret tells. My last book was about con artists, and I spent multiple years with people who deceive on a very, very high level. And I learned that if someone is good at lying, you ain't seeing it. Um, and no matter where you look, you're not going to see anything and you're going to trust them and you're going to think they're charming and charismatic. And so I knew going in that this was going to be very difficult, that it was going to be an uphill battle, which I think already gave me an edge because so many people think, oh, you know, I'm going to read a book on tells and right away I'm going to be able to see if, you know, he's doing this and he's doing that. And then they just completely over rely on these noisy things which don't mean anything and make bad decisions. So I think that it was good that I came in knowing how hard this was going to be. I think that being a psychologist and being a journalist has really trained me to be very attentive to other people. And so I was much better able, I think, than someone without that background to spot dynamics that emerged at the table. You know, who is tilting? Um, who is making whom angry? You know, how are all of these people interacting, what's going on, and to take advantage of that. That's not so much a tell as kind of a an emotional arc story, but I became quite good at that at some point. And I think that's where my edge oftentimes was in finding those little irregularities so that I could then insert myself into that story and exploit it. Um, and then I actually also worked with um, some people who've worked on tells and have actually looked at it scientifically um, over thousands of hands to see, OK, well, what information should we be paying attention to? Um, and so I learned, for instance, that you should really be looking at hands, not faces, that we give off a lot more information in our hands and how we handle chips um, and how we handle cards um, and that that's a much better thing to be paying attention to. I had no idea that that was the case, but because I had access to this literature, because I knew that, hey, you know, maybe you should ask a psychologist who studies secret keeping and not just people in the poker world, um, I was able to get a lot of that um, and hopefully, you know, use it in a way that made sense. Did you have trouble, like, after you would play, you would go back to Eric and you would discuss particular hands mm -hmm. um did you have trouble remembering i mean you have to remember so much who raised how big their stack was well you know exactly what your cards were the board was I, did you have trouble remembering all that or after each hand would you write it down or or how did you do that oh absolutely at the beginning it was nearly impossible um i would write certain things down but I just didn't notice a lot because I was so new to the world that it was just it took too much out of me to even just pay attention to how a hand was evolving. And over and over, um, Eric would not yell at me. He's never yelled at me, but be like, no, this I can't. This is not how you describe a hand. What about this? What about that? And I couldn't answer the questions he was asking me. And I'd get very frustrated and I'd say, well, how do you expect me to remember this? How do you expect me to remember that? But what he was just doing was making sure that I knew what I was supposed to be paying attention to. And eventually it became second nature. And right now, you know, it's to the point where, sure, I write down some hands, but interesting hands I can remember months later. Um, I can recreate them because I was present i knew exactly what was going on um and i it made sense to me you know it was a story that i actually as i became more fluent in the vocabulary all of these elements came together um in a different way but that took time and at the beginning it was really hard and i remember how happy i was the first time eric said to me you know that's you've gotten better at describing hands this is right this is good this hand we can talk about it was just such a you know I felt so much pride. Yes, I described a hand correctly. <laughs> <laughs> well, since you've described a hand correctly, we're going to take some commercials. The South Point has more than 10,000 games, returning more than 99%. This is more than anyone else has. And actually, it's probably down to six or 7,000 during the opening where, in many cases, every other machine has been turned off. As the show airs, there's still a few more free play with a kicker installments to pick up, which I've discussed over the past several shows. Begin July 1st, 3 a.m., the Spin to Win promotion will kick off every day, Monday through Thursday, from 3 a.m. to 2.59 a.m. the following day, 
players who learn earn 500 points at slots or 2,000 points at video poker will receive a free virtual spin at the machine. A player may earn up to four spins per day. Spins will either be points, redeemable for cash or free play, or free play. Counting points in free play at face value, in past years, the average spin has been a little more than $12 making this a 0.6 promotion for video poker players in addition to the regular 0.3% slot club for the first 8,000 coin in each day. If you're playing a game that takes, say, two hours to earn the 8,000 points, it's perfectly okay and probably healthier to earn your first four spins between 1 and 3 a.m. yesterday, and as soon as 3 a.m. comes around, play for today's spins. That reduces your trips from 18 to 9 for the same $900 EV if you can operate on that side of the clock. At Predicted.org, it's a market where you can place small bets on the occurrence of various political events, mostly but not entirely in the United States. The most active markets now are related to the upcoming election. The markets changed soon after Tulsa. GWAE listeners receive a one-time offer of a deposit match up to $20 at predicted.org slash promo slash edge. You must play the money through once and cannot withdraw it for 30 days. Blackjackapprenticeship.com is an excellent site for those of you who wish to be successful at counting cards of blackjack. There are two blackjack boot camps currently open in late July, midweek, July 22nd to 23rd, and weekend, July 25th to 26th. It's sort of an experiment to see if there's enough demand for a midweek event. The boot camps are designed to take you wherever you are in the card counting process to the next level or three. This will include lots of testing so you know how good you are or you aren't, and meeting several working pros to whom you can ask questions one-on-one. -on -one. Videopoker.com is the best place to play lots of games. If you sign up for the gold membership, $8.95 a month or $79.95 a year, this allows you to get corrections on most of the games. An additional membership, the pro membership, is sold separately, $6.95 a month or $49.95 a year. If you already are a gold member, there is a reduced rate at which you can get the pro membership. Listeners may play 1,000 hands for free to try it out at videopoker.com slash GWAE. The biggest advantage of this is that it's video poker software that corrects you on both Quick Quads and Ultimate X. Such software is relatively rare. It handles many of the things that Video Poker for Winners has, except you need to be online to use it, whereas in Video Poker, dot, or Video Poker for Winners, you do not have to be online. All right, we are talking to Maria Konnikova. Your book covers a lot of your poker highs and a whole lot of your lows. It's got to, you know, it's more about life than poker. What are some of the life lessons you learned through this game? Oh, my God. What are some of the life lessons I haven't learned? I did not realize just how much poker was going to teach me. I had no way of realizing it. You know, I didn't know anything about the game. But there were certain things that I was was prepared for. You know, I knew that poker would teach me about probabilistic thinking. I knew it would teach me about uncertainty and incomplete information because that's how I came to it. I came to it from von Neumann and game theory. So that... Yes, it did teach me that, and it made me much better able to calibrate those things in real life. And I don't want to understate that. That is a huge deal, and that's a huge gift that poker gives to the world because there's nothing else like it where you actually sample probabilities correctly and learn what 1% feels like, what 10% feels like, learn to actually internalize probabilistic thinking. So that's huge, um, and that's a lesson that I've taken, carried with me to every part of my life and my thinking and it's probably the most important one but I was prepared for it what I wasn't prepared for was what poker would 
teach me about myself emotionally, about my psychology, about my hangups, about who I am as a person. I mean, I did not realize that poker was going to be a giant therapy session. You know, I, I thought you'd go to the shrink for that, not to, not to the casino. But that's what it was. Because when you're playing these games over a long time, when you're at the table for 12 hours, you, you see it all. You see all your highs and your lows and just everything comes out at one point or another. And I learned elements of my psychology that were holding me back that I had never really wanted to confront or work through. Um, you know, I talk a lot about the gender stereotypes and how you know players would try to bully me or, or do things because I'm female. You know what? They were right to, at least at the beginning, because I had internalized a lot of those gender stereotypes throughout my life. And they could take advantage of me and they could bully me and I would overfold. Um, and I did lack confidence. Um, and these were all issues that I had to work on. And it turns out that I've been socialized much more than I ever thought possible that I did. You know, I wanted to be nice. I wanted people to like me. I didn't want to be antagonistic. So even when I had a great hand, I wouldn't raise. I wouldn't re-raise. I tried to kind of stay out of the way so that they wouldn't be thinking, oh, Maria, that's that bitch who would three bet me every single time. You know, I didn't want people to say that about me. I wanted them to have a nice time. That's not a good way of, of playing a game. <laughs> you know, that's uh, that's not what you want to do if you want to push your EV and uh, and actually make money. So it, it took me a long time to work through all of those things. But when I started working through it at the poker table, and I had to because, you know, I was losing money. This was really affecting my success rate. Um when I started working on it in poker, it trickled out to everyday life. I became more confident. I actually started negotiating better. I learned, you know, a lot about how I needed to present myself, um, what I needed to do, how I could make interactions be more equitable. And that was really, that was a huge deal for me. Um, I think that that's something that's really improved my life for the better. Um, and I can go on and I'm happy to go on if you want me to about other lessons. I just also want to give you a chance to interrupt me. Consider yourself interrupted. Uh, <laughs> your book puts up with a health problem at the 2017 World Series and ends with a bigger health scare. Do you believe poker caused those health issues? Do you intend to cut back on poker because of those issues? No, no. Th those were both migraines. Um, and I have suffered from migraines my entire life. Um, and the migraine that opens the book um, – I don't think poker had anything to do with it. Um, that one just happened. And a lot of times, you know, Las Vegas is not necessarily the best place for me in terms of migraines because um, I don't react well to um, air pressure changes. I don't react well to heat. There are lots of things that can actually trigger migraines that are present in that climate. But it happens in New York, too. So, you know, <laughs> it's a, it's a crapshoot. Um, so there are lots of things um, outside of my control there. Um, the last migraine, yeah, I think I think poker made it worse um, because I pushed myself too hard. Um, I played too much. Um, I didn't take my physical care of myself the way I should have. I didn't sleep enough. Um, and so I got a migraine that I would have gotten anyway. But I think that certain elements of the poker playing lifestyle um, turned it from a migraine to an event that could have actually caused permanent brain damage. Um, so that um, that is something that really forced me to take a step back. And actually, after that, that's when I said, you know what, we're done. Um, I need to start writing this book and take a step back from playing full time. Um, and that's exactly what I did. It was a big wake up call. You've had poker success in Europe, in the Caribbean, Macau, Vegas, and a few other United States uh, locations. Do you have a favorite or a least favorite place to play? Um, yeah, my favorite place to play is Barcelona. Um, how can it not be? You are on the ocean, you go outside during break, and you're on a beach, literally. And you can just relax and take in the water right there. And I love the ocean. You're in a beautiful city with amazing food. It's cosmopolitan. And there's not, it's not a casino city. You know, there's the casino where you're playing, but the rest of it is just culture and museums and restaurants and so much life. Um, and so without a doubt, it would be Barcelona. Um, after that, I think number two would actually be Vegas because 
Vegas also has amazing food and the Vegas rooms know how to take care of you at the best rooms. Um, so places like uh, the Aria, places like Encore, um, they really treat players well um, and run good tournaments. And there's, you know, Vegas, if you learn how to live with Vegas, there's a lot that you can do there. You can live a normal life there um, in the sense of, you know, having good food, eating well, exercising, um, going to Red Rock. There are lots of things open for you there. Um, I would say Monte Carlo, except Monte Carlo is not my favorite place. It's beautiful, but it's insanely expensive. Um, and everything is so overpriced that I just, I mean, I am not enjoying myself when I'm being charged 40 euros for a hamburger. That's not that great. Um, that is not my idea of a good time. And so just Monte Carlo disqualifies itself just on that basis alone. Plus, there's really nothing to do there. It's just gambling. It's just, that's it. Um, that's the only, that's the only oh, thing. Oh, there is the on. beach. There is the beach. There is the beach. But when I've been there, you haven't really been able to go swimming. But it's, but I would take Barcelona over Monte Carlo any day. You could see the changing of the guard at the, uh, at the castle. <laughs> yes, yes, you can do that. Um, now- how did you decide on the title, The Biggest Bluff? I don't know. Um, I went through a lot of titles, um, and that wasn't actually the title when I started working on the book. Um, we didn't know what it was going to be called. And at some point, um, it just came to me when I realized what the book was really about, um, because The Biggest Bluff isn't referring to any bluff I pulled. It's referring to the bluff that we need to pull on a daily basis, that we actually control more of our outcomes than we do. Um, this bluff that we actually, that skill can get us further than it can. Um, and I think we need to think that way. Otherwise, it's just depressing and why go on living? Um, but it's important to realize that skill has its limits. And then once you realize it, to bluff yourself and to say, you know what, I'm still going to, my decisions still matter. Writing about victories is fun. At least it is for me. <laughs> Writing about the times where you messed up which are far more plentiful, can't be as much fun. At least they aren't for me. Your first two books didn't require such literary self-flagellation. How easy or difficult was that for you? I mean, the entire book was really hard for me um, because I'm not someone who generally writes in the first person. I don't write personal essays. I don't put a lot of my personal life online. Um You know, I'm a very private public person in the sense that, you know, I have public accounts and everyone can follow me. But if you've noticed, I never there is not a single picture on any of my social media of any of my family members. Um, I never post about them. I don't you know, that's not something I do. I take it very seriously and I draw very clear cut lines um, between my professional life and my personal. And suddenly I had to just completely let go of that and open up myself because that I was the book. Um, and if I didn't do that, there would have been no book. Um, and so a lot of people, I mean, some people were shocked. They're like, oh, I didn't realize you were married. Well, I've been married for over 10 years. <laughs> you know, I've been married for a long time. Um, and it's not something I hide. I just don't want to, I'm not public about it. You know, I don't want to post lovey-dovey pictures that is another part of my life. Um, but, but there were things that people just did not realize and people, you know, people who don't know me, everyone who knows me obviously knows that I'm married and knows my husband and knows all of this, but a lot of people just had no idea. Um, and it was really difficult for me to write all of it, both the wins and the losses. Um, it was just difficult to write myself. By the way, your husband comes, I mean, I, I know you don't like to talk about your family, but your husband kind of comes off as a saint in this book. I mean, he is a saint. He, <laughs> he, he had to be incredibly understanding because you were gone for long stretches, right? I mean, and he, uh, he is amazing, and I am insanely lucky um, to be married to him. He just at the beginning he thought this is a great project, and then he would tell me when I would be worried that you know I'm about to leave for three weeks. He'd say, "Look, you know, yeah, it's not ideal." Um, but you need to do as good a job as you can. And this is, this is for your book and you need to do this to do a good job and to write the best book you can. Um, and it was really, I I couldn't have done it had he not supported it because 
you know, my marriage is really important and that it wouldn't have worked. And then, um, you know, over time he started coming with me when he could. Um, so, you know, for the last two summers in Vegas, he would spend a big chunk of the summer, um, in Vegas with me, um, which is also just the most selfless act <laughs> ever. I would not, I would not wish that on anyone if, if you're not actually playing poker. Um, he went to Barcelona with me the past two years because it's my favorite stop. And that was somewhere where you can actually enjoy, you know, enjoy life as well. Um, and so we, we made it work. And then for the last, let's say since, uh, March, um, both of us have not left our apartment. Um, and that's been working wonderfully as well. So I'm glad that we can exist at both extremes. Now you indicated how much you changed over the process of this learning experience in poker. Apparently he's willing to put up with the new you. <laughs> I don't think it's put up with. I think he's very, um, I mean, if we can trust what he says, I think he's very proud of me and very proud of what I've accomplished um, and thinks that it's a good thing. I, there was one point, and I, I think I put this in the book, where, you know, he, he saw me do something and he said, you know, you take a lot less shit from people than you used to. That's, that's a really good thing. <laughs> so so I think that he uh, he saw a lot of these changes as as positive. Um, and I think that um, I think it's made our relationship better because I have more tools, you know, for, for managing my emotions and for a lot of the things that I think are very helpful in any healthy relationship. Did it change him at all, this process? I think so. Um, at least he told me it did. He said that, so right now he's starting his own business. Um, and he said he wouldn't have done it had I not gone on this totally crazy project, entering this new world, dropping everything that I knew, um, and not shown to him that it was possible. He said that it inspired him to, to do what he's doing now. Um, I'm not sure if that's actually true, but, um, it was, an, it's a nice thing for him to say. So your husband might be a liar. <laughs> we'll see. I mean, I think everyone is a liar, um, in, in one way or another. So in the past, after you finished your books, you would go back writing for New Yorker and be a, a columnist and until the next book idea came along and then you drop out and write the next book. Is that is that kind of the plan now? I don't have a plan um, and I've never had a plan in the past. It's just what feels right at any given moment. So right now I'm just getting through this book launch. It's not the best time to be putting a book out into the world. So I'm doing my best and giving it my all. And then, you know, talk to me in a few months and uh, we'll take it from there and, and see what's what one, one day at a time is my current way of thinking. But you surely have some ideas about your next book. No, zero. I can't do that. I always, I never think about the next project until I put the current project out of mind. I'm, I don't want to half anything. Um, and so I am just like I dedicated myself 100% to learning poker right now. I'm 100% on the launch of this book. Um, and I can't, to be perfectly honest, I can't even begin to think of the next project, um, until, until this is behind me. My, I, my brain just doesn't, can't handle it. Well, Richard and I are very pleased that we were part of your 100%. <laughs> well, was, thank you. <laughs> was, and hey, I'm, uh, ha I'm so glad we were able to do it, too. All right. Do you have any parting words for our audience before we let you go? The first two words that Eric ever told me when I asked him for his greatest advice in poker, and I think that they are truly powerful pay attention. I think that's powerful advice in poker and outside the poker world. That does sound like good advice. Easier said than done. Exactly. It sounds like, yeah, of course, no shit, pay attention. But now try paying attention and actually actively paying attention and you'll see that it's very difficult. And it's pay attention to what? There's so much going on yep. and much of it is noise, but mm -hmm. You got to know a lot to know how much is noise and how much isn't. And afterwards you go, oh, yeah, I should have been paying more attention. I have some ex-wives who will tell you that. Very good. Thank you very much, Ria. Um, <laughs> Thank you. We frequently have a recommended at this time. Do you have something for our audience? Well, first of all, I would say I, I highly recommend Maria's book. 
Yes. Um, I mean, we kind of always say that, before, but but I actually really enjoyed this book. <laughs> you know, un- unfortunately, I have read not. I read her book a, a month or two ago. Um, I've read three books this week, and unfortunately, I cannot recommend any of the of the three that I read this week. <laughs> so so my recommendation is read Maria's book. <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate that. Very good. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Richard. Go out and hit lots of royal flushes, everybody. Good day.